The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann that took place on Sunday, February 8th, 2015. Hello and welcome in to eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time, where you can interact with us with your questions and comments related to the Bible, and we'll try to respond as well as possible by going to the Bible. And now, with Sunday afternoon's questions and answers, here's Chris McCann. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to eBible Fellowship Sunday afternoon question and answer program during our online fellowship time. And during this time, each person is invited to share what's ever on your mind by contacting us in one of the ways that were mentioned. Now, you can give us a call. Or you can post your question into Pal Talk, and it will be relayed to us. Or if you're on Facebook, you can send a message to Ezekiel Carvalho, and he will also relay it to us in the group today. So those are three ways that, that you can communicate with us. And I'll try to respond as much as possible by going to the Bible, as the Bible is God's holy word. Now, I would like to mention, before we begin, that E-Bible Fellowship has a new track. It's called A Strong Likelihood, October 7th, 2015, will be the end of the world. And uh, this track, uh, we, we can't send you the track right now because we don't have printed copies but it is online at ebible2.com. You can find a printable version of the track, and uh, you can print it out yourself until we're able to get uh, some copies to send to people. But at this point, you can print it out or you can read it online on ebible2.com. Okay, um, why don't we begin by going to the first person on the phone. This afternoon, welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Uh, yes, good afternoon, brother. Um, a comment and a question. But first, I'd like to say um, welcome back to uh, brother Guy Berry. I heard him last um, last time at the uh, day of the word. Uh, he spoke and asked a question, and I pray that he's doing well. I know he's been out for a while, so welcome back, brother Guy Berry. Also on that day, um, January 5th, I think the word, you know, I often say that teaching is by example. And I find it to be very much of your, your teaching, brother. Also, I say that, um, I may mention to you one time before that, well, a, a teacher, a pastor, priest, whoever, if he doesn't involve himself in his sermon, just preaches, preaches out to the congregation or to whoever's, whoever's listening and does not involve himself in his message, well then, beware, because we all fall short of the glory of God. So you also told us another thing um, on that same day when you became very emotional at the end of your sermon, and you can go on with your prayer. What you taught us there, you taught us that it's not a shame for a man to show his emotions. I'm a one very much that shows his emotions. And also lets us know that they say, well, a man is not supposed to cry. I beg to differ. A man is not a man if he doesn't not show his emotions. You didn't run and hide. You didn't go in the bathroom to let your emotions flow. You was right there in front of your audience, and you went on, and I respect you for that. So keep on doing what you're doing, brother. And I tell anyone, any child, whoever, don't be afraid to show your emotions because that releases stress. And we all should show our emotions. There's nothing wrong with that. My question is this. We have more facts of the sent day before the cross. And it's in the book of men. You probably read about this before, even discussed it. There's Brother Campbell would say, well, it should be always with bad repeating. That's Matthew 25. Matthew 25, uh, we're at. Verse 31 through 34. And verse 34. Matthew 25, 31 through 34. Okay. <clears throat> it says there, 
when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Also verse 41. 41. Um, then shall he say also unto them, On the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, I believe you said at the end of the world, he's separating all nations before him. So he's separating the, the, the saved and the unsaved. And he's telling the saved that inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So there's no way you can mix the two because the salvation, if, if he's telling them to inherit the kingdom that for you, that means salvation was paid for the foundation of the world. Okay. He, it's, yes. It's the, the, um, the language here, the, the found before uh, or from the foundation of the world ties in with uh, the other scriptures we we see where Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, it it uh, or the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So was the inheritance prepared at, in full uh, for all those that God would save each one of His elect. Now the, this passage is actually taking place over the course of Judgment Day. So mm -hmm. when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, he comes in his glory, according to Mark 24, 29, and, and uh, the following verses, immediately after the tribulation. And that means he came, beginning on May 21, 2011, in judgment, the spiritual judgment, the invisible judgment, with the holy messengers, or 10,000 of his saints, all of the elect, are judging the world with him as he is seated upon the throne of glory. And, and that language identifies with Judgment Day. But notice that the first thing that Christ does as, as judge in the Day of Judgment is... He begins a process of separating the uh, sheep from the goats. And that's what we've seen. Um, the harvest is when uh, wherein God has his people go forth and reap. And, and uh, the Bible also has told us to feed my sheep. And, and, and here in Judgment Day, we have the sheep set on the right hand where uh, which identifies with Christ, and there they are. Now you can feed them. They're over here. They're, uh, they're being separated or gathered to one side, while the unsaved are also being gathered as goats. And, mm -hmm. and, and so it's a twofold reaping process um, that's taken place in the day of judgment. Now, we're... We're familiar with the separation of the wheat and the tares, and we realize that process was underway during the the Great Tribulation, the end of the Church Age, and then it was completed by Judgment Day uh, beginning on May 21, 2011. Well, here in uh, these verses, the separation is not taking place during the Great Tribulation. That can't be. Christ is coming in glory, sitting upon the throne of glory when this separation's taking place. And, and so this uh, particularly identifies with this prolonged period of Judgment Day. And just to close, verse 41 says, it was prepared also for the unsaved at the beginning of, of, of God's salvation plan. So yes. this was done for the God says that they'd be light. Is that correct? Well, yes, because, well, well, there, there's a theological term 
that some use for um, for the unsaved, but I wouldn't use that. They call them um, uh, reprobate, as as mm-hmm. though God pre they they use the language that God predestinated uh, the unsaved to be unsaved, as well as the saved to be saved. And I I wouldn't say that we're right. all guilty, deserving of destruction, and we all would be destroyed except God intervene for a certain number of people, his elect. And and it's far better to look at election and predestination and and God preparing a people and, and just leaving the rest. It, it's not as though he has to will or or to do anything out of the ordinary, he doesn't have to do anything to the rest of mankind. They're they're just in their natural fallen condition, which leads to destruction. But we we do find in Romans chapter nine the way that God speaks of the unsaved. He says in um, verse twenty one, "Has not the potter power over the clay of the same lump?" to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? And and so God, of course, has always known who these people are, and and they are unsaved and therefore vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. They would be destroyed, ultimately, uh, because God never had a plan to save them. And uh, yet, uh, I, I would not speak of God predestinating anyone to destruction, just, just that he does predestinate certain few to salvation. Thank you, brother. You're welcome. Thank you for calling and sharing. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Brother Chris, praise the Lord for today at the end, uh, the Lord's Day. Um, I would like to uh, bring up two things about repentance, briefly repentance. and But anyway, um, I don't believe... God should repent, but just like I don't believe God has second thoughts, so, but he uses our language, our more, um, uh, he, he came down to our level and uh, speak in our uh, language like, because we're like children. and uh, uh, Well, so no, he, w- w- when God uh, says that he repents, he means he repents. Now, the Bible tells us two different things. It almost sounds like a contradiction. We Mm -hmm. read uh, in 1 Samuel 15, verse 29, and also the strength of Israel, who is God, will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. And that's true. That's a biblical truth. God is not a man that he should repent. He has not sinned right, right. that he should right. repent. And so God has no need to repent. But repent means to turn from a direction. Now, when, when men are going in a sinful direction, there is a need to repent. God has no need to repent in that way. But when men go in a sinful direction and God um, determines to destroy them, and and then in response to uh, hearing that God's going to destroy them, they beseech him or cry out or whatever, then God, during the day of salvation, allowed for himself to repent of the action of destruction. Now, we see this in the book of Jonah. In Jonah chapter 3, when God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach 
the preaching that I bid thee. And so Jonah proclaimed, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed because the, the wickedness of Nineveh had come up before God. We, we read that back in Jonah chapter 1. And it was God's intent to destroy Nineveh. But Nineveh, it, it says, was a great city at, in Jonah 3 verse 2. And literally in the Hebrew, it mean, uh, the, the language says a great city unto God. And, and that's because it typifies God's elect. The, the, and there were many of God's elect in the city. And, and so when uh, from the king on down, they repented, they cried for mercy, and, and they allowed the message of God's judgment to interrupt their lives. They didn't continue eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Everything stopped in Nineveh, and they besought the Lord uh, for mercy, because who can tell, it said in verse 9 of Jonah 3, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And then in verse 10, and God saw their works that they turn from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not. So God repented of the evil of the judgment because it was an evil thing to the Ninevites. He repented of that evil of destroying them. He turned from it. He, he uh, went the opposite way. He permitted Nineveh to continue to exist. And so God repented in that way. It has nothing to do with, with God being sinful. Uh, it, it's, a, it's just right. using the uh, meaning of the word repentance is, is to okay. turn. Uh and and that's what God regarding, did. Uh, regarding Luke 11, uh, on your uh, post in the Facebook, there were four people res that responded. One of them is uh, John Vargas, and Juan Vargas, and I asked him this morning if I could read his comment. He said, go ahead, no problem. So uh, can I read his comment and my comment? Uh, yes, as long as it's uh, not terrible. too long. Okay, one wrote, he, he said, Really, when one hears the true word of God, what attracts us is not the name of the radio station or the name of the organization. What attracts us is the exposition of the word of God, which in the spirit we know that is true and faithful. This was the reason I started listening to family radio. There were several stations claiming to be Christian in my shortwave radio, but only family radio touched my heart for proclaiming the truth. But after May 21, 2011, a spiritual feeling I felt when listening to family radio disappeared. On the contrary, I began to feel a sense of rejection until finally, again, not hear the radio, even by, his mu by its music which is wonderful. But after a year from May 21, 2011, I began to feel, feel the same spiritual feeling with someone who talked in the Bible. I felt a strong spiritual attraction within my heart. I decided to follow that voice. It was no longer a radio station. It was now on Facebook and was eBible Fellowship and is so far eBible Fellowship. And uh, so that speaks for a lot of people. And my response to uh, the parable of Luke that you teach, that you, you taught, I said, I love this parable now that it got all our attention. Praise God for having Brother Chris clarify that the shut door indicates that the timeline of heaven's door has shut, meaning salvation program ended. Thus, all elect are already saved. The two filios of Christ who, who yet live on earth are granted sustenance while they, in fact, already exist simultaneously in God's kingdom. And praise God for his agape. And because I heard you say to one of the callers, they are in God's kingdom because 
the caller was saying, the door is shut, the door is shut, and you say, yeah, but they are in God's kingdom. So that was beautiful. So uh, thank you for today, okay? Uh, thank you. Thank you okay, a lot. well, thank you Have for for sharing, okay. for calling and sharing your comments. And okay. let's uh, now take a question from um, uh, either Pal Talk or Facebook. Uh, the question is, can you please read and explain Proverbs 16.28 and Proverbs 17.14? Let's go to Proverbs 16.28. A froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. In Proverbs 17, 14, the beginning of strife is as when one letteth out water, therefore leave off contention before it be meddled with. Well, you know, we all, of course, have a tendency to strive. And strife is related to pride. We And we all, of course, are proud or or have uh, difficulty with the sin of pride. Uh, it, it's part of the big problem of fallen man. It was pride in the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden, with Adam and Eve, that they wanted to be like God. And, and that's why Satan's temptation uh, was so effective, because Satan wanted to be like God. He has... He had a problem with pride, and he came at mankind in the same area, oh, to be exalted, lifted up, to be a great one like God, and and man has always struggled with pride throughout our history, and strife is well, it, it's disputing, it's arguing, um. And and we could strive over anything. You can see people strive over uh, sports. They strive over politics. Um, they they strive over anything in the world. Uh, and there is strife in religion. The the Muslims want to strive with Christians, and Christians want to strive with Muslims. I'm, I'm speaking of the religious church. There, there is this strife. But God says of true believers, the servant of the Lord is not to strive. In 2 Timothy, it says in verse 24, no, I'll start reading in verse 23, but foolish and, un and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, and so forth. And, and here God is making it absolutely clear by using this language that the servant of the Lord, not uh, not just um, certain individuals, but everyone who is saved or thinks they're saved is a servant of the Lord. And the servant of the Lord is, is every child of God must not strive. It, it is a clear commandment. We do not strive over the Bible. That's why uh, uh, we're told to avoid foolish and unlearned questions, knowing they do gender strife, or, or strife comes as a result of these things. And I, I, I tell you, um, uh, you know, with social media today, Facebook uh, is, is an excellent um, arena for sharing the gospel, it's also an excellent arena for strife because uh, the, you, you, how do you turn somebody off? That, uh, you know, Mr. Camping, when doing the open forum, uh, w when somebody would call in and he would respond and, and answer their question or comment, 
And then they would want to quickly come back and and say, well, what about this verse? And maybe it was a legitimate point. And so he answered that. But then they quickly come back and then they call a second time, a third time, a tenth time. They kept calling month after month after month. And it is very obvious that this gendered strife. And so you hear the caller and eventually he learned um, just quickly answer, cut them off and don't allow to get into that area. And some people thought, oh, he's not giving the man a platform or he's not allowing the man to express his views. Well, what he was doing was following the Bible's directive to not get into foolish and unlearned questions because it leads to strife. And uh, on Facebook, when we poll, and this is why in eBibles groups, in some of the groups, actually in all of our groups, we post a teaching and we tell people this is uh, the teaching of the ministry of eBible fellowship. This is our understanding of this verse. And, and then, of course, the person wants to post their study and we delete it. Then the person uh, posts it again. We delete it again and we say, I'm sorry, but in this group, you're not allowed to post that. Well, it, it's almost inevitable. The person doesn't like that. Uh, we point out the group's rules. And, and again, almost inevitably, the person goes against the group's rules because they want their point of view. They want to get it across. And the next step is we we remove them from the group. And and so you'll find that in e-Bibles groups, you will not have strife. Well, there may be someone who comes in and strives, but they will not be there very long at all. We are very much desirous to follow God's directive and the servant of the Lord must not strive. Uh, some people seem to be entertained with strife, but it's a horrible thing. There's no edification of any kind. Uh, I've seen some conversations where someone knows that the other person holds the free will or the other person holds to a doctrine, and they have literally gone back and forth hundreds and hundreds of times posting one post a verse the other post a verse and back and forth back and forth a complete and utter waste of time that edifies no one because even the one who has the true point of view has lost the um well i, I of course it's the truth but but the truth has to be delivered in, in the way God would have it to be delivered. And it's never through strife. Uh, and so I think it does lose blessing when uh, people strive for the truth. It, it's of no, no use to God. But thank you for bringing up these verses. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. Could you please read Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 15, and Ephesians 4, chapter 4 to 6, I mean, verses 4 to 6? Colossians 3, beginning in verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Um, and, and then Philippians 4. And can you read verse 15? In Colossians? Yes. Okay, Colossians 3.15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you're called in one body, and be thankful. And then Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 to 6. Ephesians 4, 4 to 6. 
There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Would, the all, would all those that are called in one body be all the elect? even those that have already um, lived and died? Yes. Yes, because that's how God um, views the body of Christ or the bride of Christ or, or the house of God, the city of God. You know, they're, they're all different figures of the same thing, of all those that he has saved. And just it, it might be more helpful to look at the body of Christ as the house of God because God speaks of each uh, individual that he saved as a living stone, elect. And, and every time he saved someone, it was as though he was building his house and put a, a, a stone in place. And then he saved somebody else, he put another living stone in place. So that began um, with Abel. As far as we know, he was the first saved. And and continued all through history. Well, actually, it began with Christ, who is the foundation at the point. He, he's that foundation stone who is slain at the foundation of the world to lay the, the foundation for the house, which is another uh, difficulty people have when they insist on 33 AD, because it's as though God started building the house without the foundation. But of course, no, that's not true. He first laid the foundation, which was the death of Christ, and then he built upon it each one that he saved, living stone upon living stone, until all the way over 13,000 years, 13,023 years of history, he came to May 21, 2011. He completed the house. The body of Christ was complete. The bride had made herself ready. Um, again, just synonymous language. And then in, in the parable of the man who builds a house, it, it, isn't it interesting? In Matthew 7, it says in verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, that's Christ, which built his house upon a rock. Again, Christ um, built up a spiritual house upon himself. He's the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. So once the house is complete, then comes the storm and that's what judgment day is for the true believers it's a storm to try um us as god uses another figure if we're gold silver precious stones or wood hay stubble but here the picture is the house is tried for its security to see if it's founded upon a rock or not, because the same storm comes upon the foolish man's house and it falls because it was not founded upon a rock. So as we go through Judgment Day and as God's elect come through it and endure to the end, it ultimately gives glory to Christ as the foundation of the house. That's the reason it did not fall when the storm came against it. That's the reason the elect endure to the end because of Christ. But thank you. Thank you. For calling and sharing those passages. And uh, let's take another question from Facebook, Pal Talk. In Leviticus 19.28, is God teaching that his elect should never write on their skin or wear tattoos. Leviticus 19, uh, verse 28 says, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, 
nor print any marks upon you. I am Jehovah. Well, uh, it, it doesn't specifically say tattoos, but, uh, you know, does the Bible tell us to get a tattoo? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. That why do people get tattoos? Why would would someone mark themselves in, in one way or another? Well, someone will say uh, maybe a girl will get a nice pretty flower. It's just it's just something that's attractive. Yes, but but really tattoos are normally the result of someone wanting attention. They want someone to notice the the snakes that are covered on their arm, or they want someone to notice this other uh, thing that that they've put on themselves. It, it it's an attention drawer, and and this is where God's people part ways with the people of the world. We, the children of God, do not do things to draw attention to ourself. We desire to draw attention to Christ, to the Word of God. And, and this is why um, a believer dresses modestly, as the Bible tells us. It's why a believer uh, would, would uh, try to be well-groomed, just not to draw attention to themselves. And it's why we would not want to get a tattoo. It, it, there's, there's really no purpose in getting a tattoo other than to draw attention to ourself. And, uh, well, what if, what if we got a tattoo that, that uh, had the cross? Or, no, uh, again, God uh, is not worshipped that way. He's not worshipped in in doing physical things like that. God is worshipped in spirit and in truth. And, and so God is much more concerned with what is going on inwardly. Do we have Christ in our heart, not some image of him on our skin? That means nothing. Having a cross on our skin means nothing. Just, just like having a necklace means nothing. It's what's going on within. That's the great concern of the Bible and of God. And that's where people seem not to want to look. They, they want to focus on outward things, physical things, fleshly things. Tattoos lead us in that kind of direction. But thank you for uh, sharing your question. In that verse, and let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. When God destroyed the world in Noah's day, approximately what was the world population? Well, we don't know exactly, but it was probably no more than a million or two million people, um, which, uh, it you know, today we have small cities that, that have that number of people. Because a lot of people don't want to believe that God will destroy children and babes. There had to be uh, children and babes in the flood of Noah's day. Oh, yes. The, you know, when God shut the door, when, yeah, when I, uh, he had said to Noah, yet seven days, and, and I'll bring the floodwaters, and, and then seven days passed. And then Noah and his family and all the animals were in the ark, and God shut the door. Then yeah. a, a torrential downpour. Water started coming from all kinds of different sources, and the floods would have risen very quickly, and, and the majority of people would have been living um, close to one another because God had not yet uh, divided the continents. It was just one large land mass. And as far as we know, uh, mankind was uh, being social creatures pretty much gathered together. There, the Tower of Babel would not even happen till later, so everyone spoke the same language. More than likely, the vast majority of people lived in close proximity, and 
then just just put yourself back there in the position of the people of the world of Noah's day who saw Noah build the ark that crazy guy for 120 years they they heard him preach because he was a preacher of righteousness and first right. peter 3 tells us that christ preached to the spirits in prison in the time while the ark was a preparing and and christ did that through noah and and so we know they heard the flood was coming that's why the the ship was being built and now on the day noah would have made known a heavy downpour begins and it rains and rains and rains and it rains into the next day and and they've never seen so much water well what do you think those people were doing now god doesn't tell us this this is speculation but come on people are people people uh they would have had sense that they, they they can put two and two together back then just like we can now and i know if i was a person outside the ark and and it started raining like that at the time that man noah who who other than his his uh uh you know this uh preaching about a flood was a was a pretty sane person and uh you know he seemed pretty solid in every other area and and now here comes this tremendous rain like we've never seen on the day that he said it would begin i'm going to head for the ark i'm going to get my family and and i'm going to the ark i'm going to get my little children and and go to the ark i'm sure some people probably more than some came to the ark as the rains began to fall and uh, again this is speculation but i think uh this is how people would have reacted and god did not open the door god shut the door on the day he said he would and right th there was no further proclamation it, 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 there is no language in the bible that that the door opened again well, now you people can see, you know, you know that's how we would act. Uh, th that's what we would do. We would open up the door afterwards and we would say, look, we told you so. Now, come on, get in. And, and people uh, they, in the Bible, uh, they, they like to respond after the fact. That's what Esau did when uh, Jacob got the blessing. Then after the fact, he starts weeping and crying uh, rather than before he wasn't broken before it was afterwards when it was too late that's what they did after searching the land for 40 days and coming back with an evil report it was after the fact after god said due to your evil report you're going to wander a year for each day you search the land 40 years in the wilderness well then they wanted to go up and then they were brave and and wanted to fight the inhabitants of the land but it was after the fact no god sets a date god sets a time and you have up until that time and once the time comes god is not like us he does not go back he does not rescind the things that he said uh, well uh, I I said I would shut the door, and I did shut the door. But now here you come, since you see the rain. Uh, it, uh, no, it, it's uh, because that was a result of uh, the physical. They they saw the physical uh, response, or or they saw uh, literal rain, and and yet God operates in the spiritual by faith. And, and, and it's through faith you enter into the kingdom of heaven through the faith of Christ. And so you needed to respond by faith, by the power of God, before the door shut. And it's the same thing with May 21, 2011, that, right. that uh, now it's too late. It, God is not going to open the door. 
He's not going to, um, we, we don't read that when people are knocking, Lord, Lord, uh, o- open to me. We, we do not read that God opens the door, but rather he says, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. But Chris, there are verses that uh, teach that there were children and babes in that day too, right? Well, yeah, of course. It, it was like any other it had to be. any other uh, city or town or people. Uh, yeah, you you have to have yeah. the people of all ages. Um, there there weren't just uh, <laughs> you know people are okay if everybody who died is sixty five or over. No, it, yeah. it it wasn't just elderly or middle aged or young people. It, it was people of every age. It was teenagers. It, it was 10-year-olds. It was toddlers. It was infants. And I'm sure there were some babies in the womb that, that would have perished in the flood. God is no respecter of persons. That's right. Saved is saved. And God can save a baby in the womb or he can save uh, an old man or anybody in between. And likewise, there can be an unsaved baby in the womb or an unsaved old man or anybody in between. And and uh, when God shut the door of the ark, it indicated the saved are inside, the unsaved are outside, and that would have been men, women, and children. But thank you well, for thank calling you. and sharing. And let's take another question from facebook or pal talk uh, there is a teaching that i think is not correct that seems to be gaining momentum that god is using false gospels to judge the world during this day of judgment please comment well you, you see we find language of god utilizing satan and false gospels to bring judgment and destruction on the churches and congregations during the Great Tribulation period. So, um, yes, it was a means that God used. He allowed Satan to enter into the church, to take his seat as the man of sin, and Satan's emissaries, uh, they brought destruction. They wreaked havoc within the congregations of the world through their their teachings, their false teachings. But when we get to Judgment Day, May 21, 2011, it is not the methodology God is using to judge the world. The methodology God is using to judge the world primarily involves the completion of his salvation program in saving the last of his elect, which permitted him to shut the door of heaven and and to put out the light of the gospel. And it is not false gospels that are bringing the judgment to the unsaved people. It is the true gospel. The true gospel now lacks mercy, lacks grace, lacks salvation. And and, uh, for it, it doesn't matter if someone believes the true gospel or the false gospel today in one sense that neither of them will bring salvation. And, and so God is judging the world through his word, the Bible, the true word of God. It, it, it is the true word of God that is going forth, and the Bible itself that is proclaiming this, that God has stopped saving people. That is the, the means, or that is um, the methodology of God's judgment. Satan is an object of the wrath of God. The emissaries of Satan are now the objects of the wrath of God. They're the targets. They're no longer the ones bringing the judgment. No, the, the 
the locusts in Revelation 9 are the true believers. The 200 million horsemen are the true believers. It is God, his word, and his people that are involved in the judgment process, and the objects of the judgment are Satan and his emissaries and and uh, all the unsaved who would bring false doctrine or false gospel. It It, it is not them bringing the, the judgment in any way. That is a complete misunderstanding of what the Bible says. But thank you for your question. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Sunday afternoon question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Brother Chris. Um, first and foremost, I thank God for eBible Fellowship. Um, my question is on the studies in Revelation 18, specifically referring to Babylon. She sits a queen and says she's no longer a widow. So I want to compare that to 1 Timothy 5, verse 5, and Isaiah 54, pretty much all the way to verse 5, but just I'm trying to understand, get a better understanding between widow, desolate, because he calls her barren and she's a widow, but by yeah. verse 5 he tells her he has a husband, So, and then there is one more thing where as long as she lay desolate, she enjoyed her Sabbath. So I'm just trying to get a better understanding of all those things that I just well, corrected. Well, Thank the, the, fir- um, the first John, did you say first John 5-5? Five, five? No, first Timothy 5 Verse 5. 1 Timothy 5. Okay. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. In 1 Timothy, we, we read of God's definition of widows. All widows are not equal. You, you can have a widow that has children, and she is not a widow indeed because she has children to help take care of her, and they should. But a widow indeed is a woman without children, and and then that that is called a widow indeed. It's just further defined. The church was to take care of widows indeed because they had no children. Well, now the, the idea of widow and loss of children points to desolation, and that's what we were seeing by the language in Revelation 18, verse 7, and also in Isaiah 47, that uh, where it speaks of Babylon as being a widow and also suffering the loss of children. God is emphasizing that she will be desolate. Now, in, in Isaiah 54, we read um, in verse 1, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, Break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith Jehovah. Um, now, I, I've heard Mr. Camping do a very good study on Isaiah 54, in which, because I, I was struggling with this passage too, and it wasn't until that he he showed how the children of the desolate are the children of the great tribulation period. It's it's that great multitude that is outside of the churches and congregations because God made the churches desolate and called his people out and 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 so here come the true believers outside of the churches at a time of desolation. And yet more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife. And the married wife would point to the uh, the church age, even though the New Testament church was never married to Christ. They're typified by Israel who did enjoy a marriage relationship with God. And and so God uses that figure to point to all those saved during the church age. 
So there's more children of the desolate, more that become saved during that little season of latter rain when the church age has ended, than the children of the married wife or the, the number of people that became saved over the course of the 1955 years of the church age. So this language does not relate to Babylon saying, I am a widow. It, it, again, the emphasis on Babylon saying, I am not a widow. The emphasis of Babylon is, I am not desolate, or I really will not come under the judgment of God. And uh, it, it's a different focus than what's going on here in Isaiah 54. You know, Chris, my next question was that the term desolation or just desolation has to be related to a time frame. So you just uh, answered that. Um, I just, you know, things are just coming together nicely through your teachings. And I also still do Brother Camping's teachings. I'm doing to Jeremiah now, and I'm grateful to God. And um, I'm just thankful to him and to this Holy Spirit, however he's doing it. It's just magnificent. So praise to God always. Amen. Bye-bye. Well, thank you for calling and sharing and bringing up these verses. And let's um, go to Facebook, Paltaw, to get the next question. Uh, greetings, EBF. Is Proverbs 8, 24, 25 a reference to the fact that Christ was slain before the foundation of the world to complete salvation before the world began? Let's take a look at Proverbs 8. And verse 24, well, I'll start reading in uh, verse 23. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, was I brought forth. And yes, this is referring to wisdom, the personification of wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8, and, and wisdom is Christ. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30 tells us that Jesus is wisdom. He's the essence of wisdom. And so um, he was set up from everlasting, meaning that uh, he is God. He is eternal God, and he's always been God. And, and so uh, he's always been wise and, and so forth. So wisdom uh, identifies with the being of God, and God has no beginning. He has always been. And even though it says from the beginning, but notice that God is, is linking in Proverbs 8.23, everlasting with the beginning. That's defining the beginning as everlasting. Well, everlasting has no beginning. That's something that needs to be kept in mind in some places where the word beginning uh, is used. It could be that it actually is pointing to eternity past. But let's see exactly what your question was. Um, well, it it you know, Christ was slain, the Bible tells us, from the foundation of the world. The foundation of the world was at a point in eternity past. And we do not understand eternity past it, it, because it's beyond time. And, and so at what point in eternity past? Uh, there is a, a statement in the Psalms that says that God has had mercy upon his elect from everlasting. And that very well could be that uh, Christ was slain as a lamb from the point of everlasting. And, and that would be the beginning of the foundation of the world at whatever point, later point, God would create the world. That is the world's foundation. Not only this world, but the foundation of the new heaven and new earth to come. But thank you for uh, sharing those verses. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our 
question and answer program that, uh, this afternoon. Please go ahead with your call. Uh, good evening, Brother Chris. How is everything? Hope all is well. Um, yes, I'm doing well. Thank you. In reference to your teaching today, very good teaching. Uh, I was listening to um, numbers earlier today and came across some verses which I think is, you know, is parallel to um, your teaching. Uh, first, let's take a look at uh, Psalm um, chapter 9, verse 16. Psalm 9, 15 says, The heathen, who are the nations, the heathen, are sunk down in the pit that they made, in the net which they hid, is their own foot taken. And then uh, verse 16 also. Jehovah is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Higion Selah. In, in reference to one of the calls uh, earlier, um, you know, questioning um, were there young babies and so forth during the flood, and you know, questions I've heard in the past, people questioning, you know, God's, uh, you know, ability to destroy um, the young and the widows, etc. Um, this this verse is, is indicating that it is man's uh, wickedness that destroy them, not God. The it's a judgment that he, uh, God passed a judgment like in Adam and Eve in the day you eat of uh, the fruit of good and evil, you shall surely die. And they did, and, you know, they slowly died physically. Um, but in Numbers, um, Numbers uh, uh, 14, uh, take a look at verse 21 through 24, 223, mm -hmm. sorry. Numbers 14, yeah. and verse 21, But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of Jehovah, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice, surely... They shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither, sh neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. And, and the reason I brought this, this, these verses up, and they're more like verses 31 to 35, uh, in relation to today, um, the fact that this is when the, the nation of Israel um, escaped Egypt uh, on all the miracles that God did, and the unbelief of uh, the people. Um, the judgment God has passed there was that uh, those that are 20 or younger will go into the promised land, and those who are older, of course, they, they perish. We go down to verse 21 through 25, we give the time frame of the 40 years for each uh, day, etc. Uh, my point in, uh, with your teaching earlier, uh, the patience of God, you know, his patient came on May 21, and he, he shut the door to heaven. As a result, you know, those who, uh, you know, professor, who rented their garments, etc., um, you know, uh, there's a number of them that are you know, like the folks back in uh, in this period where they, they have come to truth, they have seen the hand of God, but they are still in doubt. And, Dying. Yes, uh, you know, God is very clear that that he will judge the unsaved. And the unsaved also include children. For instance, in Isaiah chapter 13, which is a chapter that speaks of God, uh, the day of Jehovah's wrath and punishing the world, and he likens the punishment of the world to the destruction of Babylon. And Babylon was destroyed by the Medes and the Persians. And the king of the Medes and the Persians, Cyrus, also known as Darius, is a type of Christ. We can show that from the Bible. So when the Medes and the Persians, led by Cyrus, took Babylon in one night, um, they... They're a picture of Christ taking the kingdom of Satan 
in the day of judgment, which began on May 21, 2011. And it says in Isaiah 13, beginning in verse 16, their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses shall be spoiled and their wives ravished. Behold, I will stir up the meads against them, which shall not regard silver. And as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. Now, this is the word of God. This is God's words. It's not my words. It's not um, anybody else's words. It's God's words. And, and sometimes people try to avoid them because it's speaking of Medes uh, uh, who are killing the children. And, and yet, spiritually, the teaching is clear. The teaching is that in the day of judgment, as Isaiah 13 is a chapter devoted to judgment day, that Christ will come with his people and the people of God will not spare children nor have pity on the fruit of the womb. And, and I tell you, if, if there is anyone that we want to have pity on, it, it's when you hear a child born after May 21, 2011, or, or born um, 2013 or 2014, or even now, and, and you want to, to say, oh, uh, there has to be hope for them. That's, that is our desire. But then we look at the Bible, and we see there is no movement. The door is shut. There is no possibility for God to open the door again. And, and we each have to uh, understand what that means. And, and so God is telling us that in the day of judgment, that he will have no pity on the fruit of the womb, nor spare children. It, it is the day of wrath, the day of destruction for all the unsaved. And, uh, you know, I'm reminded in Luke 16 of the parable of the rich man in hell. He, he's in that intense fire, and he just wants a drop of water, just a drop of water, and there's Lazarus, the messenger of God, Lazarus typifies the believers who were, have been despised and lowly, outcasts of the world. But now Lazarus is, is beckoned, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger and, and come touch my lips because I, I'm tormented in this flame. Just a drop of water. And, and then the answer is that they which would come from hence to you, cannot. So we believers that are living in the world, we would. It is our desire because we, we're, we're not made perfect in our understanding, or, or we would be in a perfect agreement with God's judgment. And, and so we have a weakness in that area. And we would, believe me, if we could bring a drop of water and much more, if possible. But they which would cannot pass from hence to you. There's a great gulf fixed, and, and we cannot open up the door. It is, it is not within our ability to do so. We're, we're just a doorkeeper. If, if you want to know what we do, we're doorkeepers. We receive instructions. And God tells us, open up the door. It's, it's the time of the latter rain. I'm going to save a great multitude. So we tell everybody, the door's wide open. Uh, come in. A great door and effectual is open. And, well, we rejoice in that. And, and then God shuts the door, and he sends the, the information to the doorkeepers. Now you have to tell everyone the door is shut. And... Uh, just as it was flung wide open, uh, and, and we had nothing to do with that, 
Now God has shut it. It was God who shut the, the, the door of the ark. God shut them in, not Noah. Noah and his family didn't shut the door. God shut it. It was God that shut the door on May 21, 2011, not us. And since God shut it, we can't open it. What he has shut, no man can open. There's an inability to open the door of heaven. We, we could not even open it for ourselves if we were not saved. It's God who brought us in. But we're just a doorkeeper, and that's our complete role. We tell people, as a doorkeeper, the situation of the door to heaven. And at this time, it's shut, and it will never open again to this world. But thank you for sharing. And uh, let's go to next question on Facebook, Pal Talk. Will you address Genesis 8.22, especially where God says that seed time and harvest shall not cease? While the earth remains, regarding Luke 21, 36, the original Greek for always reads in every season. The Greek, karo, meaning season is the same as the word time, as in the time of harvest of Matthew 13, 30, when the wheat and the tares are separated. When a commandment to pray for what is now impossible be completely contradictory to the nature of God, incapable of deception. Well, I'm not sure I understand everything you're saying there, but let's go back to Genesis 8, 22. And it says uh, there, While the earth remaineth seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Now, uh, this, this was brought up recently, and we went over this recently on Question and Answer Program. But... This is um, language that relates to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. In Ecclesiastes 3, God says there is a time for everything, for every season under the sun, a time to be born, a time to die, a time for this and a time for that, and so on. And, and God gives pairs. Uh, let, let me just look at Ecclesiastes 3. He says, um, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. Now, the time to plant would relate to seed time, the time to pluck up to harvest. Now, when we read the language of Judgment Day in the Bible, we don't read anything about sowing seed or seed time. We read of harvest. In, in, take a look at Revelation 14 in, in verses um, 14 through 20. And in verse after verse after verse, it's time to reap. The harvest of the earth is ripe. And, and so thrust in your sickle to reap. It's reap, reap, reap the harvest. And, it, well, why doesn't God talk about seed time there? Because it's judgment day. Seed time identifies with the day of salvation. You sow the seed, as in the parable of the sower. The gospel goes forth and you throw seed here and there. It lands on the hearts of men. That's seed time. But once we enter into judgment day, we come to harvest time. And, and, and so God has given pairs in Genesis 8.22. Seed time identifies with a particular time and season. Harvest identifies with a particular time and season. Cold and heat and summer and winter. Summer and harvest are synonymous. And heat goes with summer. Winter goes with cold. And it was during a winter season, as God likens the Great Tribulation to winter, that much seed was sown. And then day and night is also paired. Day, if you want to look at it spiritually, identifies with the day of salvation. Night with judgment day. The night comes in which no man can work. And, and, and so just as if Christ came 
today, which he won't, because he does everything orderly and according to his timetable. God doesn't do things randomly, as as the church would have us believe. But but let's say that this is the day. Christ comes, and and it is day. So uh, uh, did he? He didn't come day and night. Uh, of course, some places it may be night. But as for me, as far as I'm concerned, he came in the day because that's where uh, the time of day it was. And, and yet it doesn't mean that uh, he he did not fulfill this verse because um, night, it, it's, it's sequential. Uh, the day comes and the night would follow, but he happened to come for me in the day before the night could arrive in in my time zone. Likewise, spiritually, there's a sequence of events. There was the day of salvation. Now we've entered into the night of judgment. There was a seed time. Now we've entered into harvest. There was um, a cold, but now heat identifies with harvest. There was winter, the tribulation, but now... We're in the summer, which identifies with harvest, and harvest identifies with judgment day. And, and that means the order of events from day to night spiritually is, is also um, in sequence. And, and there's no problem at all if you want to look at that verse spiritually. Now, the time to plant is a different time than the time to pluck up that which is planted. You can't do both at the same time. If you're sowing seed, you don't pluck up the seed you just sown, but it must grow, bring forth fruit. Then comes the time to reap, to pluck it up. And, and so everything in its time, in its season, there, there's nothing in this verse. There, there is nothing in this verse that teaches ongoing salvation to the very last moment of time in the world. And, and if this verse, this one verse, did teach what, what some think it teaches, uh, that would only be a starting point. Because then you have, all right, now what, what happens in Bible study, you would have this verse standing alone in opposition to Revelation 14 and and to Jeremiah 50 and 51 and and the whole biblical calendar of history and 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 all sorts of scripture and and if anyone were serious and there has been no serious effort that has made any progress if someone were seriously attempting to uh, find the truth concerning whether there is ongoing salvation at this time after the tribulation, then this would be a starting verse, and now you would have to harmonize all the dozens and, and dozens of other verses and passages and chapters in the Bible that teach contrary to what you claim this verse is teaching. But that's not the case. Uh, the, what some people are attempting to do is say, now, the way I understand Genesis 8.22, it means ongoing salvation, and, and that's it. That's all I need. Um, uh, and, and they're not listening to hundreds of hours of Bible study in the book of Revelation, in Jeremiah, in Isaiah 24, in Daniel, and, and Matthew, and so forth, that is teaching directly opposite to that conclusion, and they have no intention of harmonizing this one verse with all those many statements. It's just like when, when people point to a verse concerning free will, can you find a verse that apparently indicates that, that a man's free will is involved in salvation? Sure, sure you can. You can find a handful of verses maybe even more. Uh, but what about all the rest of the Bible's information that says, oh no, oh no, the, the dead 
have no ability to get themselves saved and and uh, were were saved by the will of God, not by the will of man. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, it says in John, and, and all kinds of scripture. That's exact. They, free will people do not try to harmonize their um, singular verse that they have only scratched the surface on at, with all those other verses. And they they just settle on their conclusion. Well, this is what I believe. This, this is what I think the Bible says. This is what my pastor says. This is um, how I understand salvation. All right, fine. You understand that to be the case? Well, you're go uh, and and you're free to follow your understanding. But the Bible doesn't teach that. And until you harmonize all the many verses that that speak of predestination and so forth, and and that man's spiritual deadness with those few verses that seem to indicate free will, then you're holding to a position contrary to the Bible. Likewise, now this is a first step. If you truly think that this verse supports ongoing salvation, now get busy and go answer the hundreds of other verses that teach contrary. But there is no movement in that direction. So, you're free, just like the free will person uh, or the, the person who wants to believe God speaks in tongues, wh whatever false doctrine. You're free to hold on to your false doctrine and to maintain God is still saving because you have found a verse that you apparently believe teaches that. Very well, go your way. But know this, the Bible does not support your position for a second. And, and, and uh, there's, there's just enormous information that stands opposed to that kind of conclusion. But thank you for sharing your question. And uh, I'm sorry, we have come to the end of our time today. Uh, we'll not be able to uh, continue and, and go on with the other callers, but thank you for being with us and for sharing your questions and your comments, and especially the Bible verses that we had an opportunity to read and consider. Lord willing, we'll be going back to our online fellowship for more scripture reading and hymn singing. Please join us tonight, uh, if possible, in our Sunday night Facebook question and answer group uh, beginning at 9 p.m. till 10.30 p.m. Um, Lord willing, uh, on Facebook in the Sunday open Q&A group um, that, that we have there. It's a text question and answer group. And also, I'd like to mention that Monday night, the live Q&A uh, will not be held. It, it will be a recording. Uh, the reason for this is that we've been doing these um, Monday and Friday night question and answer studies for a, a long time. And really, it's been the same people, just just small group of people um, night after night. And at this point, since we're getting short on time, it might be better to look for a wiser use of time. Um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Maybe as we get closer to October, more people will be involved in the question and answer. But but just for now, this Monday, we'll have a recording. We will, Lord willing, on Friday, have another live question and answer group this coming Friday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. But for now, may you have a good afternoon, and may the Lord's perfect will be done. And thanks for joining us again for eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time with your speaker, Chris McCann. You can join us for these questions and answers sessions Sunday afternoon following Sunday studies and Monday and Friday evenings following the Monday and Friday evening studies. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.